Okay, thanks uh, everyone for, for coming to this EAE virtual uh, seminar. It's great to have such a big turnout. We're at 62 now and it's still going up, so this is very exciting. And the talk today we have is, uh, is also really exciting. Um, it's uh, going to be given by Professor Tamsin Mather from the University of Oxford. And most of you will know that um, uh, Tamsin was to be our, our, our distinguished uh, uh, seminar speaker for, for 2020. Of course, that didn't happen because of the COVID situation, but he's kindly agreed to give us a, a virtual seminar. Um, and so Professor Mather is a professor of earth sciences at uh, the University of Oxford. Um, she got a PhD from Cambridge and has been working between sort of Oxford and the other place since, since then. Um, and she's uh, become a really distinguished scientist in sort of the field of volcanoes. She won the Rosalind Frank Franklin Award, um, <laughs> which uh, comes with a public, public lecture. So if you um, haven't uh, seen that public lecture, you should go check it out because it's a, a really great uh, piece of science communication. Um, and Professor Mathers works uh, basically on volcanoes from a lot of different angles. So she thinks about volcanoes in terms of uh, their natural hazard, them as a natural hazard, but also in terms of um, what they can tell us about past climates, which is uh, of particular interest to some of the, the more climate people in, uh, in our school. Um, so just as a, a kind of the usual um, housekeeping thing, if you are, uh, could mute your microphones and um, uh, also probably uh, turn off your video for now. And if you have questions and stuff, please uh, post them in the chat. I can uh, monitor that for uh, as we go through and um, uh, we'll, if there's something that, that we can uh, uh, answer during the seminar, I'll try and pick that out, but otherwise uh, we'll just wait till the end. Um, but otherwise, um, I'll, I'll hand it over to you, Tamsin. Um, thanks very much for, for giving us uh, this seminar. Oh, thank you very much, Marty. So, uh, yeah, as, as, as Marty said, do put questions in the chat or any problems as well. I won't actually monitor the chat myself, but I'll let uh, Marty very kindly off to do that. Just uh, too much to kind of concentrate on the slides and the chat. So yeah, it's um, a real pleasure to speak to you this morning. Um, I'm very, very disappointed not to have made it to Australia uh, a few months ago, but obviously just part of all the uh, all the change and craziness we've, we've been experiencing as a global population right now. So really, really hopeful that I might make it over to, uh, to see you all at some stage before too long. Um, I guess I've been living my life on Zoom as probably many of us are, um, and I've been trying to adjust to that quite a lot. So I do find kind of giving these seminars, just looking at my laptop sitting in my basement, quite different to standing up in front of an audience. Um, and another thing I've been experimenting with is the, um, oh, hang on, my slides going to, there we go, the virtual background. This was my first attempt at a virtual background during a meeting of the volcano group here. Um, where you can see that it didn't quite work out for me and um, I managed to uh, become the volcano rather than having the volcano um, <laughs> behind me. So I put this up on Twitter because I thought everyone was probably experiencing some teething problems with, with Zoom uh, and virtual meetings. I was quite pleased with some of the responses I got. I got kind of likened to various sorts of uh, lava monster, which is a volcanologist, is obviously something that uh, I guess you sort of aspire to, including... Uh, Take car in uh, in Moana, which I was pleased about. I got this sort of picture from the uh, the Lord of the Rings, Lord of the Rings, uh, particularly with the Oxford connection, always very pleasing. Uh, quite pleased, of course, as well with people talking about a Zoom meeting with a being of unspeakable power. Um, perhaps a, a member of the X Men. That was fantastic. Uh, and my favourite one, which somebody saying I can't imagine a better deity to teach uh, volcanology. So I was quite chuffed with that one. Uh, slightly less chuffed with this one, Colin McPherson, who some of you might know, who's a former head of department in Durham, um, and this was his first thought. So those, th th those are sort of my adventures with Zoom um, recently, but uh, I expect we've all been having our own kind of glitches uh, with this new virtual universe that we find ourselves <laughs> inhabiting. So um, I, like to, I wanted to start off the seminar with this image here. Um, so this is an image from the Earth at the Yerkut eruption in 2010. Uh, and for those of us in Northern Europe, which I appreciate uh, is, is not the crowd I'm talking to today, it's quite an evocative uh, image because most people have some sort of experience in the pre-COVID world about this massive travel disruption that we had due to the Earth at the Yerkut eruption in 2010. Um, it's, uh, it's a fantastic image. Uh, you can see this, this volcanic plume going off here. You can see this sort of uh, lava pouring out down the side here. And then this, this bolt of lightning, which is actually associated with the volcanic plume. 
Um, and of course, it answers a very important question, which is how do you um, how do you make an image of a volcanic plume more spectacular? And here's your answer: you 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 add a bolt of lightning to it. And this lightning is actually generated by the volcanic plume, which is one of the things I've, I've worked on over the years. The reason I particularly like this image is because, as I say, it, it shut down um, a huge area of airspace over, over several weeks and impacted a lot of people. And the reason it closed that airspace is because of the hazard to aviation. And so it reminds us all that volcanoes are a hazard and there are hazards to lives and to livelihoods. They're an economic hazard. Um, and so we, you know, we we need to understand them in terms of uh, in terms of as a as a natural hazard. Um, but this this volcano is situated in Iceland, um, and in Iceland, a really significant percentage of the power in Iceland is generated from geothermal power. So it also reminds us that volcanoes are resources as well, um, and managing those resources is really important. And of course, they're also implicated in different ways in generating ore deposits. Um, and I know there's a lot of expertise over in Australia, particularly in that area. But it, it's also a useful illustration as well of the role, the important role um, that volcanoes have played in terms of the evolution of our planet, and indeed the evolution of life on our planet. So I just that that sort of um, symbolised in this photo really by this this bolt of lightning here. This has actually been one of the candidate uh, environments for generating the first molecules of life. And then volcanoes have continued to play a role in terms of uh, the evolution and maintenance of the Earth's atmosphere, and as I'm gonna come on to talk, talk about uh, later on as well, in terms of the big changes that have gone on in things like biology over the history of our planet. Um, if you ever want a uh, amusing break uh, from, uh, from productive stuff, but do have a look, there's a great YouTube clip of all the news readers across the world trying to say this, this word, I thought the Yerkut, um, and uh, stumbling over it. Uh, and it, it's, it's, it's very funny, um, and I have a lot of sympathy for them because if you're used to reading off words off your teleprompter and this suddenly comes up, uh, I mean, you can see the fear in their eyes. It's really quite beautiful. So when I was uh, putting a, I'm gonna really focus today on some of the ways that uh, over geological history, um, Earth's, uh, the volcanoes have, have really impacted in, uh, the planet's development. Um, and I'm going to really hope to convince you today that there are lessons to be learned from sitting in present day volcanic plumes or making measurements around present day volcanic activity that we can kind of apply over great swathes of geological time. So back in 2015, I put together a review chapter. I kind of tried to think of all the different ways that uh, volcanoes can have a prolonged global effect. Uh, and I made this list here, which I, I sort of won't read out to you. But just sort of they range from these single short short lived eruptions, which can have a sort of global effect and people have speculated could shift the planet into things like different ice ages. But also when you've got like temporal clustering of volcanoes as well, well, the changes in the gas load and feedbacks with other parts of the Earth system. But what I'm really going to focus in on today is large igneous provinces. And I know some of you know a lot about large igneous provinces, but I also will explain what those are. So if we just take a step back and think about um, how volcanoes impact our environment. So volcanoes are in many ways, I mean, there are lots of different things, but they're, they're, they're one way you can think about them is they're kind of conduits between the solid earth, they're valves, they're conduits between the solid earth uh, and the earth's uh, outer reservoirs, so the atmosphere, the biosphere, and things like that. So you can take, take key material from the mantle and other internal reservoirs, the crust, and putting, out, putting it out into the, the wider environment. Um, and if we think about what volcanoes produce, there's the other things like lava flows, um, pyroclastic flows, the kind of local hazards, if you like. Um, and these can be really important, but they they're also can be quite local in terms of their effect. So if we start to think about things that might have a wider spread footprint, then we're really thinking about kind of the things that are put out in plumes. Um, so ash, gas, and aerosol. So let's take a sort of step back and think a bit about what those what those components might be. So we start off with the magma at depth um, and the pressure drops, and it's like taking your uh, taking the lid off your 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 coke can or your soft uh, your your beverage of choice, and the bubbles nucleate in the conduit, and if the start travelling up like this. And you, uh, you basically, so if you've got, depending on the kind of material properties of the magma, you can get fragmentation of that and you can get a significant ash phase 
um, being um, being developed. So I could I do my beautiful drawing here. These are these these brown blobs that you can see. So you've got the the ash, the pulverized magma, the fragmented magma that might be coming out. But there's also a whole bunch of other things that are coming out as well. And these include the gases themselves that were actually originally dissolved in the magma. So the major two gases, the major gas tends to be water in volcanic plumes. So a lot of the volcanic activity that we're seeing is actually driven by the, the water that's been dissolved. And this shouldn't be a, a huge surprise. Water is a very ubiquitous uh, substance, uh, substance on our blue planet. Uh, and then second to that tends to be uh, carbon dioxide coming out of uh, volcanic plumes. But uh, then we've got a whole uh, a host of other things. I mean, in many ways, volcanoes kind of put out the periodic table. But just to kind of talk through a few, we've got the sulphur gaseous species. We've got sulphur dioxide and hydrogen sulphide. We've got sulphur dioxide, which smells a bit like burnt matches, and hydrogen sulphide that smells a bit like rotten eggs. And I've often wished I could kind of get up, climb up the volcano, take a good sniff, and be able to actually distinguish between uh, what proportion we have of each of those just by the smell rather than having to carry a load of heavy equipment and batteries uh, but unfortunately I've never managed to calibrate my nostrils quite the, to quite to that extent but you have these uh, these two species here that do various things in the atmosphere including uh, oxidizing and actually as sulfur sulf sulf dioxide uh, hydrogen sulfide will oxidize sulfur dioxide which will then react with various oxidants in the atmosphere to give you sulfuric acid. And sulfuric acid tends to form something called an aerosol, which is like a haze. And that's kind of important in terms of some of the effects, effects that volcanoes have. Then we have the uh, acidic halogen species, so hydrogen fluoride, hydrogen chloride, uh, quite a, the, these two relatively abundant, and then hydrogen bromide, uh, less abundant. Um, so hydrochloric acid, these are all acidic and cause acid rain sulfur dioxide too. And then later on we'll come and talk about the fact that they also put out a host of uh, trace metals including mercury out into the environment. Um, and different plumes, different types of volcanic activity can put, put these, different, these things out in different proportions. Um, and I really like this photo from Mount Etna, this was a, the 2001 eruption of Mount Etna, where we can see uh, in, in Italy where you can actually see this, uh, so it's taken from a, a light aircraft but you can see that the same volcano is putting out three rather different types of plume into the atmosphere all at the same time. So from the fissure eruption down here, you've got a really ash-rich plume. From the, uh, from the northeast crater up here, you've got this, this aerosol-rich steam um, and gas plume with very, very little uh, ash or silicate material in it. And then at the southeast crater here, you've got sort of something in between. You've got this kind of medium plume there. So you've got... Um, You've got, you've got a sort of real balance, a real cocktail, really, of different stuff they're putting out. Um, and it's worth noting that this eruption going on here is something that doesn't happen every day at Mount Etna. But like many volcanoes around the world, this, this, this aerosol and gas plume is something it's doing uh, all the time. And there's a huge range of different types of volcanism um, on our planet. So we've got, as I said, we've got this kind of everyday volcanism that I was just hinting at. Um, the Etna was, we've got this example here from Etna, but this is, this is Messiah Volcano in Nicaragua, this is Volcano Volcano, uh, quite close to Etna in Italy, this is uh, Hawaii, uh, Kilauea Volcano in Hawaii. Um, and these are, this is everyday activity, so it's not something that really necessarily makes the headlines, it's something that, uh, that is something that they're pumping out every day and they're kind of maintaining the atmosphere. And then if we go up the explosivity scale, this is kind of a nighttime photo of this type of activity from Etna. So this is something that switches on and switches off. So it's not going on all the time, but it's slightly putting out slightly more gas and particles and ash when it does happen. And then we can move over to things like Mount St. Helens. We just passed the 40th anniversary of this eruption on the 18th of May. These very much more sporadic, much, much less common eruptions that happen, maybe one in 50, one in 100 years where really big plumes of material are punched really high up into our atmosphere. And this eruption, of course, covered the a large area of North America in ash. But then it's worth remembering that there are types of volcanism on our planet. So we have some experience of all these sorts of types of volcanism here, but there's types of volcanism on our planet that we, we've actually never experienced as a species, or certainly not during historic and scientific times. So this is a, an aerial, this is a satellite image of Lake Toba, 
which is uh, about, this is about 100 kilometers just to scale. This is in Indonesia. Um, and this is the site of the last, what we call super volcano, or I prefer to call a magnitude eight, but journalists prefer super volcano for obvious reasons, which is about 75,000 years ago. Uh, this is actually a series of different calderas, it's not, but this is an absolutely enormous eruption of a scale that we've never seen. So it's, on, it's of a similar sort of type to Mount St. Helens, although there's, a, there's some, some important differences as well. But, uh, but we, we actually have, as a species, we haven't in historical times experienced that, although people do uh, talk about a evolutionary bottleneck associated with this, which is a little, uh, the jury is a little out on that. But um, what I want to talk a bit more about today are these large igneous provinces. I'm going to kind of spend a bit of time explaining what these are, but this was the latest. This is the, the Columbia River basalt, which was 17 million years ago. And these absolute pile upon pile of lava flow that are up to over a period of time. So let's zoom in on these for a bit. So the 17 million years ago, we haven't as a species had any experience of that. So this is the most recent, the Columbia River flood basalt. Um, you can see there's a sort of barn here and a smaller a, a coach or a car um, just here to give you a sense of scale. And what you have here is pile upon pile of lava flow. You can make out a few of the horizons there, piled up on top of each other. And I'm going to zoom in on another one that you may have heard of, which is the Deccan Traps in India. Just to give you a sense of these, this is the, uh, the footprint of uh, the subaerial Deccan Traps in India, there's a bit more, a little bit more detail here um, in terms of uh, the different types of lava you have. And here's a sort of classic photo of this pile, this massive topography, this pile upon pile of lava. Um, and the Deccan Traps is basically about a half a million cubic kilometers of material. So it's quite hard to imagine what half a million cubic kilometers is, but I hope I got my, I basically did some calculations last night to work out what a cubic kilometre would be in terms of um, the area of Melbourne or Canberra. So I think if I've got my calculations correct, a cubic kilometre of magma would cover the whole of Melbourne to about one, uh, 10 centimetres depth of, of magma. So that's just one cubic kilometre. Uh, whereas it would cover the whole of Canberra to 1.2 metres of depth. Um, if, if my Wikipedia areas of Melbourne and Canberra are correct. So when I say a, a cubic kilometre of magma, you can hold whichever ever image you prefer. You can hold an image of 10 centimetres over the whole of uh, Melbourne or 1.2 metres over the whole of Canberra, depending on uh, your own personal preference. But these are absolutely vast. So this is half a million of those that's covered this, this area of uh, India. And it's erupted mainly over a period of about one, uh, one million years. And it puts out also sort of a, a huge amount of gas. So just sort of uh, about sort of 10 to the six million tons of sulfur dioxide. So they're coming out over a really long period of time. They're really, really large. Um, and there's lots of questions about that because they're so far back in time. Um, so how constant does the magma come out? We know we, we've got good field evidence to show that it's pulsed. We've got good field evidence to show that there's a, a real um, surge in activity and then some hiatuses, some calm periods. And it's actually quite hard to put that together from the, the rock record because they're dispersed over such wide areas. And also we don't always get paleosol development between these. And I've just shown you two here. So I've shown you some pictures from the Columbia River of flood basalt there and the Deccan traps down here. But the, whole, the surface of the earth is kind of peppered with these, uh, these, these, these remnants, if you like, of these extraordinary geological events. Um, so these, the ones in red here are the ones that are continental flood basalts, basalts. And then we've got some oceanic plateaus as well. So things like Ontong Java um, and, uh, and such like that are very significant ocean features. But if I could just draw your attention to a couple that I'm going to talk about a little bit more, is the Siberian traps um, up here in northern, northern Asia, um, uh, in Siberia, as you might expect. This enormous uh, area up here erupted about 250 million years ago. Um, and then the Central Atlantic Magmatic Province, or the CAMP, um, which I might, might refer to sometimes, that's now um, split between three continents in North America, South America, and then Africa here and was this, uh, this enormous flood basalt province put out about 200 uh, million years ago. 
So you see, we've got lots of these in the geological record. The thing that people have noticed is that they uh, correlate with uh, changes in the geological record. So this is just a sort of cartoon representation, and I thoroughly apologize to um, any paleo paleobiologists uh, on the call here. But this is a sort of very rough cartoon uh, representation of kind of species diversity over geological times. This is a snapshot of the geological record just going back 600 um, million years. And what you can see is it's not constant um, in its, in its uh, variation. You get these big rises and then also these big falls as well. Um, and there are, in the geological record, there are five in particular that people sometimes call the big five. So the Endor Division, the Late Devonian, the End Permian, the End Triassic, and the End Cretaceous. And some people actually argue we're in the uh, sixth uh, mass extinction right now. Um, and of course, people have started, you put, started to kind of uh, uh, correlate these with these, these large igneous provinces. So if we go and look at the Deccan, Deccan traps that we were just looking at here, this lines up with the roughly with the end Cretaceous mass extinction here. But of course, uh, there's been a lot of, uh, there's been a lot of study, there's been a lot of discussion of this end Cretaceous. And this is in part because this is when the dinosaurs, this was, it was the most recent mass extinction, but also when the dinosaurs died out, which have really cu captured our, our imagination as a species. But we have this complexity here because we have uh, the Deccan traps going off, but we also have the big crater, the Chicxulub crater. So there was a big uh, impact onto the earth at the same time um, and I just uh, you can get some there's some fantastic sort of cartoons on the internet about this so you've got to, this is an illustration from the crowd who uh, who blamed the volcano so we've got some t-rex um, here with the volcano going off in the background and it kind of almost looks as if every dinosaur was killed by its own individual rock which I don't think anybody is arguing for but this is the sort of artist's impression that we have here some poor dinosaur here has already succumbed possibly to T-Rex or maybe to the volcano. And then you get some others like, I quite like this one, which is, hey, Arthur, check it out, a shooting star. That's a sure sign of good luck, my friend. Well, it turned out not so much to be a sign of good luck. But there is this, this complexity here is we have two possible uh, triggers and it's possible, of course, that they, they both contributed to it. But the interesting thing is if we put the, the Deccan to the uh, Cretaceous um, to one side, if we look at the, um, the lineup, we, get, we also see this, this association in time between the Siberian traps and the M Permian and the N Triassic and the uh, Central Atlantic Magmatic Province. Um, and there's an association with the Valais traps also in Siberia and the, the Lake Devonian, although they are they're less well preserved. And of course, this is a challenge because as we go further back in time, we're losing, our, we're losing a lot of our, our seafloor, um, both to subduction, but also to uh, accretionary to tectonic, pro other tectonic processes. We've got weathering, we've got overprinting. So we, we do start to lose even our, our record of the, uh, of, the, of the large igneous provinces as we go back in time. So that's the kind of headline story, but actually there's, a really, there's, there's even a more interesting story in some of the detail here. So if we take this, if we take a detail of the geological record um, in like this, um, we can make a plot like uh, we could we could actually sort of put out some other um, inf we can draw out some more information here. So this this timeline is just another a some more detailed um, snapshot of this geological timeline here. And we've got large igneous provinces along the bottom here. So just to sort of draw you in, that's the Siberian traps there. That's the Emishan, um, and then this. Uh, this is the camp here at the end Triassic. And then we've got the, uh, the Deccan traps here in the, uh, the end Cretaceous. Um, but we of course have some others like the Karoo Farrar, for example, and I won't go through all their names. And the, the warm colors here mean they're sub aerial and the, the colder colors mean that they're, they're submarine here. So we've got all those, if you remember that map, we've sort of put these into the timeline here. And then these stars are different um, types of events. So the, green, the dark green ones are those big, are members of the big five mass extinction events. Then we have smaller extinction events, so smaller uh, perturbations to the geological record. And then these, these open stars, which are actually carbon isotope excursions, so changes in the carbon cycle that aren't necessarily uh, associated with a massive response in terms of biology. Um, we've also got on this diagram, we've got these dark or these light bars here, and that's representing ocean anoxia. 
and I'll just uh, mention what ocean anoxia is. Is these they, these are these these quite kind of um, startling events. If this is a, a section near Italy, um, near uh, Gubbio, and you can see these big changes in terms of the geology that's being laid down, the sedimentary rocks. So we go from these these white rocks, these black shales. This band, there's a, a human being there, the scale. Um, this is sort of the, the deposits from this period here. These, this. So what this is telling us is there's a real perturbation in terms of what's going on in the oceans, and the oceans actually become depleted in oxygen. And the mechanism that people propose for that is actually mediated by warming of the planet, so you get an accelerated hydrological cycle, increased pro productivity of plankton, um, and then that puts down organic matter and depletes the, the oceans of oxygen. So the point I'm trying to make to you here really is that the mass extinctions are, um, are just part of the story. We can actually see that we've got these, these, we've got, we've got these events going on, these carbonized take excursions, these evidence of the ocean chemistry really changing and that being also associated with these, uh, these, these large igneous provinces, this changing, changing the, these massive kind of, uh, these massive pulses in terms of volcanic activity on our planet. Um, and just to sort of some of the ways that we try and understand this is actually to sort of think about what we understand about the impacts of volcanism on the present day. And this is a slightly busy diagram, but it's something that me and Anya Schmidt just put together for a book chapter we were involved in writing. So you remember I was talking to you about all those different uh, emissions, so sulfur dioxide, halogens, ash, lava flows, carbon dioxide that the volcanoes were putting out into the atmosphere. So you think about each of those emissions, you can start to think about the consequences those different emissions have on our atmosphere. So sulfur dioxide can cause short-term short cooling acid rain, as can the halogens, just to take that example. Halogens can lead to ozone depletion. But then, of course, we've also got carbon dioxide that can lead to long-term warming. Um, and uh, I won't talk about this too much right now, but I'm happy to take questions on it. But of course, we've also got, when it comes to large igneous provinces, we've got these other potential inputs in terms of uplift releasing gas hydrates, so the uplift of the crust associated with the, the, the upwelling in, in the mantle. And then if you've got large igneous provinces uh, going through uh, hydrocarbon deposits, for example, they can remobilize those. So what this diagram really was about was about the different modelling studies that have been done in order to try and understand these consequences. So this is kind of my first point actually, is that what, a lot of what we've, a lot of how we come up with these different sort of lists and these different effects that we want to model is by studying present day volcanoes. But the challenge that we have with present day, studying present day volcanoes is we haven't really, we haven't got anything going on, thankfully in many ways right now. That is, um, that is of the same scale as a large igneous province. So this, this is, uh, these, are, these are the large igneous provinces. These are our best estimates of the kind of cubic kilometers per year that they put out. This is the best studied flow of a large igneous province. It's the, the Rosa flow of the Columbia River um, flood basalts. And you can see this is the one we, can, we understand the timings on best and it's putting out something. Um, so it's a particular, it's a particular episode of the Columbia River flood basalts and it's put, putting out um, nearly a hundred cubic kilometers per year we reckon onto the surface of the planet. If we start sort of averaging over the longer time periods of the the large igneous provinces these not the, these rates come down quite a lot but as I sort of hinted at earlier this is really a key unknown because they, probably, they may well all have been going off like this, but just then having these pause periods, these hiatuses in between the, the different episodes. But if we turn now to what we have on um, the present day planet, and we look at like the flux from Kilauea volcano in Hawaii, very active from 1980s until 2012, you can see it's, it's, this is a logarithmic scale, it's orders of magnitude less than that. In fact, the closest analogy we have is the um, Larkey eruption in Iceland in the 1780s. Um, and then recently, two eruptions, um, the 2018 eruption of Kilauea, which was starting to edge up towards those levels, but was very short-lived, um, and uh, the Holleran eruption in Iceland, which is what I'm going to come on to. So one of the first things in our toolkit we have is actually trying to study these, these types of eruptions in order to understand more about this. And of course, these also uh, help us to understand more about what's going on for the populations uh, living around these volcanoes. 
So I was hoping to talk a bit more about the uh, Kilauea eruption today, but actually the, the, um, I'll have to, hopefully I'll get a chance to tell you about that when I make it to Australia, because we've just got the papers submitted on this. So, uh, so it's a little bit premature to present them too widely. Um, and we're still developing some aspects of the story. But I'm going to talk about the Holoran eruption in 2014 to 2015. So here's a, uh, an image from the Holoran eruption. Very spectacular. Again, it answers that question about how you can make a volcanic plume more spectacular. You can put the northern lights in the background. Uh, although I'd like to highlight there's no causal, there's no mechanistic link between the northern lights and the hollow eruption in this case. It just happens to be that you can see them quite often from Iceland. So you can see this is a, this is a snow plow, a sort of snow vehicle uh, for scale here. Um, the eruption lasted about six months and it put about a cubic kilometre. So if you have that image in your head, of 10 centimetres over Melbourne or 1.2 over Canberra, um, a cubic kilometre out onto the surface of the planet. So really, really small in terms of a large igneous province. And we saw that in the previous diagram. Six to eight million tonnes of sulphur dioxide, so not to be uh, sniffed at. And just to sort of give you an idea, it was up here, this is Iceland um, in between the US, uh, the North, Northern America and, uh, and uh, Europe. And it was just coming, it sort of peaked out, the, the Flopia was just the north of the Vatniyoka, which is this uh, ice, ice field here. So it was, a, it, Icelandic terms, it was a pretty important eruption. It was the largest eruption since Larki, that eruption in the 70-80s. It lasted about six months, as I said. The, the SO2 it was putting out actually meant that sometimes it was the, it was, it was uh, the, um, it absolutely dwarfed the other long-term SO2 emitters, uh, both natural and anthropogenic, uh, in, in, in Europe. So it was a really, really important sulfur dioxide source, which means we can see it really easily. Um, and uh, from a UK perspective, it was, uh, it was kind of really interesting to study as well, because we uh, added the uh, large Icelandic fissure eruptions to the risk register. Um, in order to, uh, so it's something that we want to understand the impact on us as a, a country as well. So just to put it in perspective, you know, I already mentioned Ayafat Yerka, which is actually a tiny eruption on the scale of things. Here's Holoran in terms of the erupted, erupted volume. And here's that Larky eruption that I mentioned um, earlier. So you can see it's still a, it's st it's still a lot smaller than, than Larky. Um, but Larky still sort of has an important, um, memory in terms of the Icelandic population because about 20 to 25 percent of the population actually died following the the Larky eruption largely due to the famine and fluoride po poisoning so a lot of the livestock uh, died as well but the Holoran eruption was the first time that sulfur dioxide concentrations had reached dangerous levels for um, the first time for modern Iceland so there was a real operational sense to the work we were doing as well in terms of trying to understand the local hazard as well as trying to kind of understand more about the impacts of these eruptions. So the tools that we brought to the table were, um, were, were using satellite data. So we're using ultraviolet and infrared satellite data to look at where the plume was going. Oh, and using the infrared, we can also uh, retrieve... Somebody try to say something. I've got some. Okay, um, we can using the infrared. We can also uh, treat, retrieve plume height, which turns out to be really, really important in terms of where stuff actually goes. So we were combining these with um, with modelling results in order to try and understand both what was going on in the plume, but also process get a process understanding as well. So this is just to give you a sense of what we can get from the satellite. This is the North Pole, roughly uh, looking down looking down here and what we have here is the amount of sulfur dioxide so there's the, the source point it's just about there on Iceland but we can actually get quite a synoptic view using the satellites um, you can see these plumes of sulfur dioxide circulating around the, the northern hemisphere here um, and what we have on this side is the height of that sulfur dioxide as well so that we weren't able to do this in real time during the eruption but we can put this together in retrospect to actually see the that what was going on in terms of the, um, the plumes of uh, sulfur dioxide traveling around, which is quite, uh, quite interesting as well from an atmospheric dynamics point of view. Um, we, were, we were combining this with the, we were using the NAME model, which is what, one of the UK Met Office um, transport and, chem, uh, and chemical um, processing models. 
So we were putting together, we were using the satellite data. So these are UV um, and infrared outputs here together with the name model. And there was a, a sort of variety of different things we could do. It was also help that the name model allows us to do near real time air quality forecasting, part of what it's uh, designed to do. But in terms of thinking about how we then take lessons from this back in geological time, you're also trying to expand our process understanding of, of the chemistry going on in the volcanic plume. So this is just to sort of show you um, how we can match up the, this is the name model output for this only orbit here. This, uh, this is the UV instrument on the satellite. And then this is the infrared instrument on the satellite. And this is the, the name model output. Um, and if you're a volcanologist as well, we could backtrack to best fit the flux coming out of the volcano. So that was also a very helpful um, aspect to this. And one of the reasons that we want to understand some of the process, just to take one of the processes that we want to understand is that oxidation of sulfur dioxide to sulfuric acid. Um, and part of the reason for that, so as the plume tra travels away from the volcano, we have this oxidation, this chemical reaction of sulfur dioxide to sulfuric acid droplets. Um, and we want to understand that because they have different, uh, different impacts in terms of the population and the environment. And actually the population exposure to SO2 is quite well known, but aerosol effects are, are less well known. So, uh, so, so uh, but PM is, particular matter or PM is certainly, uh, of, uh, has, a, has a big health implication in terms of human beings and livestock. So we were also, as well as the satellite measurements, we were doing um, measurements on the ground. So we had measurements going on at the capital in Reykjavik and at the clo this close town, which I won't try to pronounce. I'm just going to call it close town because my um, Icelandic, I'm afraid, is pretty poor. Um, and we were basically measuring sulfur dioxide and um, aerosol in different ways at these different sites. And we also made some measurements uh, right up close to the lava field, although I'm not going to present any of that data today. <laughs> Uh, just a few field photos. Unfortunately, for personal reasons, I couldn't make it on this field trip, but here are Anya and Evgenia making some measurements right up close. You can see the plume going off in the background. They got to go up in the helicopter um, and make some measurements actually in the plumes over the, uh, over the outflow field like this, which uh, is very spectacular. And they also set up, this is in the, this is in the close town, so they set up their scientific station in the local school. So you can see all the, the lovely artwork from the children here in the background. Uh, and here we have an aerosol sampler and some pretty heavy duty pumps. So, uh, and they had an inlet going through the window there. So as usual, as volcanologists, they were using all resources to hand. So if we look at some of the results, we can see that, so the, um, this is the close town, um, 100 kilometers distance, and this is Reykjavik, where most of the population of Iceland is. And um, started to see some sort of quite work. So it was you know, useful to understand basically this green bar here is when things are safe, sulfur dioxide levels are safe. Yellow is when things are moderately and then we get into the orange up here. Um, and you can see that we were getting into the orange up here, which is very unhealthy for people with asthma or other breathing difficulties. And the close town basically had 88 hours over 10 days when they were up in the red zone. Um, and Reykjavik had 34 hours over seven days um, up in this, this red zone here. So if we take the, I'm taking this Reykjavik data now, um, and we're gonna use daily averages. These are hourly averages, we're not gonna do daily averages because there were some interesting things that we found when we were looking at this. Um, and one of the interesting things, so now this is the safe limit here, and this is the sulfur dioxide time series. So you can again see the spikiness in terms of the exposure of the population. But there was this day on the, quite early on, on the 20th of September, where basically locals were reporting really, really bad uh, consequences. So eyes and throat were burning, um, but the, the, the um, alert levels were, were kept very low and the sulfur dioxide levels were, were, well in the, were well in the safe zone. But people were reporting these impacts. But I think this is one of the things is if you just measure one chemical species, if you just measure sulfur dioxide, you lose something of the picture. Because when we start, when we put the, the particulate matter and the sulfate aerosol, the sulfate phase, that oxidation product onto this, what you can see is while there was very little sulfur dioxide there, there was actually this big spike of sulfate aerosol particulate matter at this time. And that was actually what was causing more of the health problems or more of the 
the, the feeling of uh, the, feel, the, the difficulties for locals than, um, than actually the sulfur dioxide. So we actually found we had these two different types of plumes with different impacts in terms of um, the local populations and health. So we have this plume with low sulfur dioxide and high sulfate, and then these plumes with high sulfur dioxide and, um, and high sulfate as well. So we, we started calling these the kind of the young plume and the mature plumes. The idea is that once you start to react, there's two ways you can, you can kind of get this situation. You can react away most of your sulfur dioxide to give you these very high sulfate levels. Or actually another way you can do it is dynamically by separating off the aerosol component of the plume from the, the gas component of the plume. And this was quite help. This was, this was useful in terms of our interaction. We were working with the Icelandic Met Office. The way they've been running their forecasts had really been very focused on the sulfur dioxide. So this was what the forecast looked like for that day, the 20th of September. Um, but actually, if we then run the, if we run the name model, you can see the sort of uh, a rough agreement with that, with this sort of high area going off down there, slightly different time period going there, which then agrees with the sulfur dioxide that we can see in the satellites, because we can't yet see sulfate aerosol on the satellite. But if we now use the model, if we now use the chemistry in the model, um, and look at what the um, sulfate is doing. You see, again, there's this hot area down here, which lines up with the sulfur dioxide, but we also have this older plume curling around like this, um, and this tendril coming down over, over Reykjavik here, which was causing that problem in the air quality. So from an operational sense, it became um, clear that for a eruption like this, we had to use the chemistry in the models and not just use sulfur dioxide as a proxy for the plume but also think about the sulfate the, the mature plume the the older product in terms of uh, in terms of thinking about air quality um and uh, just to put this so that was the 20th so it was actually it turned out when we ran the models the 8th of september a little bit uh, earlier than that we had a very uh, near Reykjavik and uh, various places had quite a near miss in that we had the same issue with this, uh, the plume going, this is what we were seeing on the satellites, the plume going like that. But if we ran the models, there was this huge area of sulfate aerosol that fortunately went off over the Atlantic and uh, didn't, didn't hit populations. Um, I don't want to go into this slide in too much detail because I've got a little bit more I wanted to say before I finish up, but this was, um, just to say that it wasn't just Iceland, we focused our measurements on Iceland because it was more concentrated, but the effects of this plume were, were seen in, uh, in, in uh, particularly in northern Scotland and parts of Ireland. So it was, uh, there, was some, there, was, there was certainly some far field effects as well. So um, just relating that back to the large igneous provinces, you know, we're, we're trying to use those sorts of uh, our understanding of the chemistry in these plumes to, uh, to basically refine our models so that we can then go and think about different scenarios in terms of the, the large igneous provinces. Um, um, Anya did a piece of work um, a few years back now where she was looking, do you remember I was saying about whether something is pulsed and how much of a break you get between the different lava flows? So if you have these pulses of activity and then these, these breaks in between the different lava flows, um, you can get recovery um, in terms of the different kind of uh, environmental effects you're seeing. So Anya started running these types of models. Basically, this is on surface temperature change, which is one of the other things that sulfate aerosols do does for you. Um, and you have this uh, the, this pulsing here. So you, if you if you put the same if you put the same if you put a bit amount of material out over a 50 year period, and have a sustained eruption over 50 years, and then stop it you get quite a different environmental response to if you push it out in two pulses. So you have this break in between the two. But actually the planet can recover quite to a large extent. So this is for the, this is for the Columbia River basalts uh, rosa flow. Um, and this is for the, um, the Deccan traps. So you've got this, uh, that you've got this, this is a larger scale of experiment than this one. So I'm just trying to make the point to you that actually understanding the chemistry going on in the plumes in the present day is, is giving us important lessons in terms of the past. Um, so I'll, I probably won't go into this in too much detail because I'm running a little bit short of time. But I just wanted to go back to the geological record. And I already introduced to you these carbon isotope excursions and uh, these, uh, these, these oceanoxic events. So we see we've got all this richness in the, uh, in the geological record. And one of the challenges for us is actually tying in um, the timescale 
of the um, of, of when the large igneous province volcanism is going off um, and when it's happening, tying that in to this geological record we have of other things going on. Um, and again, so we're, go, we're now looking at the central Antic magmatic province. We're going back to the, the, um, the end Triassic. This is what the, the world look like, looks like here. And these are some sediment core logs. The reason I wanted to show you the Central Atlantic Magmatic Province is there we have the very fortunate um, coincidence of actually having some of the lava flows from the Central Atlantic Magmatic Province actually cutting into the sediment cores that we're, we're looking at to understand the biological changes and the carbon cycle changes. So some photos here from the Fundy Basin, uh, which is number six up here in, in Canada in present day terms. And you can see here is the basalt flow. There are some people in this photo here for scale. And you can see this basalt flow here with the sediment pile um, underneath it here. One of the challenges is we're often, in this case, we actually have them intersecting each other. But what we're often doing is picking up bits of rocks from those lava flows on the surface and then dating them. Um, and this is uh, some work done by um, the Princeton group, um, I think, not long, I can't, sorry, the screen has uh, altered itself, so I can't see the bottom of my slides. Um, but uh, but what we, when we, we take them, we basically are dating zircon crystals in them. So each of these lines represents a zircon crystal from flow. And we've got a statistical problem to try and tie that down to a single age for the flow. And that's what these, these black lines are here. What you can start to see is there's this big range in terms of possible ages here, because we actually have the flow this number one refers to this flow here. We can see that this, this bar here does actually tie together here, but it's quite a lot of uncertainty. So if we didn't have that strate stratigraphic marker, we would be in trouble. And this is again where sitting in a volcanic plume present day comes in. So this is a picture of me up on, on Mount Etna making some, some measurements. Um, oh yeah, I went and gave a talk in, in Birmingham not that long ago and they used this picture to advertise the talk, which I thought was quite amusing, this lovely Victorian lady going up, probably Vesuvius, to, uh, to but she, they didn't know where it was from, to, to make her measurements or to view the volcano. So one day my aspiration is to go up in a similar, in similar costume, but as you can see normally I'm wearing something a little bit more practical. Um, and we make, we, one of the things that I've been working on since my PhD, in fact, is actually the mercury emissions coming out of, uh, of volcanic um, craters and volcanic, and volcanic plumes. And this is some of the equipment we use just to pull out. Basically, mercury is quite tricky to measure. You have to do specialist equipment because it comes out largely as a gas, which is really important. So here we have different things like gold traps to, to measure the mercury coming out, filter packs. This is a denuder for me me measuring reactive mercury. Um, and the reason I was initially interested in measuring mercury coming out of volcanoes is because it's toxic and bioaccumulates in the, in the food chain. Um, and it, it's uh, basically volcanoes are a major natural source and it gets very widely distributed in the atmosphere. So a volcano in, um, a volcano in New Zealand uh, will basically mix through the whole southern hemisphere, but also uh, also into the northern hemisphere as well, because it has a lengthy atmospheric lifetime. So if you take a breath now, we're all breathing in about one to two nanograms per cubic meter of mercury. And volcanoes are, are a major, if not the major, natural source. So we wanted to understand what volcanoes were putting out in order to understand uh, changes and, and human perturbations to the mercury cycle. But actually, it turns out that people then started measuring mercury in the sediments, in the very sediments that were recording carbon isotope, isotope excursions um, and, um, uh, and biological changes. Uh, and mercury was proposed as this very useful marker in the geological record of, of when you have the, 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 vulc the volcanoes putting the mercury out of the atmosphere. So this is now that same plot, that same diagram of the geological record I showed you earlier, and I've just added on. This is a, even this is already out of date. All the mercury studies that have been done, largely showing these spikes of mercury in association with these uh, these different large igneous provinces going off. And this is really just a taster. I could give the whole talk on this. So hopefully, when I come to uh, the Australia, I can talk to you more about this. Um, but this was the first paper to do this. This was Hamid Sanai's work in 2012, looking at the end Permian event. Um, and I just want to draw your attention here to this map. This is the extinction horizon, the late Permian 
uh, extinction. There's massive spike in mercury normalized to total organic carbon here, which is said to be due to the Siberian traps going off. So this was a fingerprint, if you like, of the volcanism in the record. And the cool thing, we're now switching up to the, um, the end Triassic here, but the, kind of the, the, the really promising thing uh, in one, from one perspective is this might be a, a way of giving us some idea of pulsed, how pulsed these large igneous provinces were. So you remember the Central Atlantic magmatic province, we had this very fortunate um, situation where we can actually tie some of the flows to specific, specific points in the stratigraphy. Um, and what we did then was, this is work from my PhD student, Lawrence Percival, is we looked at a whole range of different um, uh, sediment cores from different parts of the world. Um, and we were able to see that there's this big pulse in Mercury around, this is the end Triassic extinction event horizon here. So it looks like uh, there was a really, really big pulse of, um, of camp volcanism going on uh, associated with this, uh, with this, this trigger. But if we kind of drill, drill into it a bit more, we can see there are also some other evidences of other pulses later on as well. And from my perspective, one thing I think is really inspiring about this for me is because we've got this much better, this is the stratigraphy of the, uh, of the province because it intercuts with some of these sedimentary logs. Um, we can almost sort of see that there's this, this we think that this end Triassic here, this is when the lower, high, the lower high atlas pulses were going off. So we can almost, this is, I've never been there, but this is a sort of photo of that lower high atlas flow um, in the field now. And I quite like to imagine that there's a, a pulse of uh, mercury that was released from these rocks uh, hundreds of millions of years ago. Um, and then we released it in my lab and analyzed it. And here it is plotted on the graph. So there's this real sort of almost, uh, almost a, a, a sort of unusually intimate connection between, between the, uh, the past and the present for me in terms of unra unraveling the secrets of the history of our planet. And as I said, we're hoping there's, there's a, that, that, uh, that we can begin to use these records to understand province intensity because we've got this massive area to map out otherwise. So we'd like to have, it, uh, ha have something that we can use to compare with that. I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to skip over these last couple of slides. I'll have to tell you about that. There's some really interesting developments. Of course, the story turns out to be more complicated than just Mercury means volcano. But actually, in that complexity, there's some really exciting things about maybe learning about the past biosphere as well and the, uh, the, the terrestrial carbon reservoir. Um, so I'm going to kind of end it there. So I really hope what I've um, convinced you of today is that by understanding present day volcanic, volcanic emissions, we can really sort of use that to test our models and then to, uh, to help us to understand past and, and future maybe climate feedbacks. Um, we, uh, we, we need to understand the processes going on in volcanic plumes and of course those are likely to vary over geological time. We need to improve our models of those. And new proxies for volcanism in deep time like mercury have great pro promise but we've also got a lot of intricacies but the real hope is that we can use the better, t the better, the, the better association then of uh, the volcanic pulses in geological time scale to actually really tease out cause and effect in terms of things like the biosphere response, the carbon cycle response, for example. Um, but there's a lot still to understand. So uh, for any students on the line, there's still uh, plenty for you guys to sort out for the rest of us over your scientific careers. Thank you very much. Great, thank you so much. Um, and that was really a wonderful talk. And um, you kind of touched on the three areas in, uh, in EAE even better than I, I could have ever imagined, the, um, uh, the ge geology, the, the atmospheric science and the kind of geography and, and biosphere uh, impacts. Um, so I think we have a few minutes for questions. Is there, um, I think it's probably best if you uh, um, type into the chat and then I can call upon you. So Oliver, if you want to speak up. Yes, excellent talk. Thank you very much, beautiful. Um, when it comes to volcanic eruptions of, um, of large igneous provinces, obviously you say there's a link between mass extinction and those sort of eruptions. So if I understand correctly, if you have a global effect, you need to reach certain heights in the atmosphere, like stratospheric levels or so. 
So do we actually know, because those volcanic eruptions are not very water rich, how much, what's the percentage of those that actually do go into these upper levels and have, an, have a global effect? It's an absolutely key question. Uh, um, thank you for raising it. Yeah, it's something I could talk about. I, I have slides on that, but not in this slide pack. So there's, um, there's an interesting thing. Um, so Laurie Glaze did some modeling work. I mean, she's done previous modeling work, but I think it was uh, probably two or three years ago. It's one of those things where I always think it was last year, but then it turned out to be 2015 or something. But um, the, uh, yeah, Laurie, it's Laurie, so one of the interesting things is that, um, again, because these really energetic fissure eruptions, we have different experiences of actually looking at them and studying them. Uh, but some of her work from um, one of the Japanese uh, fissure eruptions, uh, far fountaining eruptions, which are likely to be characteristic of this, um, showed real potential for the for a lofting effect. So it's rather different to something you get in, in Mount St. Helens, where you actually have the, the ash taking the heat and punching the, the, the column high up into the atmosphere. You have the, the scoria, which is more of a more the basaltic kind of end member, uh, falling out. And then the hot gas actually lofts up and can get up into the higher atmosphere. But having never seen a large igneous province go, go off, it is, it is still a big unknown. And if you go through some of those modeling studies I talked about, there, is, there are a range of different assumptions made. Um, and I think more needs to be done to think about um, sensitivity analysis to the, the assumptions made about the, the injection height. Uh, over time of the different emissions. So you're absolutely right. It's a, it's a key point and it's a key unknown. Thank you. Right. I think uh, Ray Cass had a question and then Penny King after that. Yes. Uh, thanks, Tams. And that was just really uh, interesting and uh, very well presented. Thank you. That uh, you've focused on what were relatively short lived high magma output events such as the large igneous provinces. But I noticed on one of your slides where you have a histogram of uh, output rates, you also listed the mid-oceanic spreading ridges, which are, of course, very long term, been active in the last 50 or 60 million years uh, constantly. So what sort of um, proportion of the, the, the gases output do they provide? So, um, yeah, that's, a, that's, that's a, a, an interesting one as well. I have to admit that, you know, I, uh, I'd love to go and do some field work at uh, Mid-Ocean Ridge. Uh, it's uh, just, uh, it's more tricky. And so uh, I guess I started with the easy gig, which was to work on the land. Um, but, uh, but it's always something I've been really interested in there. There's actually some really, um, as you say, it's the, it, it, it's the uh, I mean, there's a different talk I could give you about carbon dioxide that might have more relevance in terms of this. So some of the work that we've been do doing, working on carbon dioxide emissions from East Africa, um, and the sort of comparative uh, emissions with uh, with the the ocean ridges, um, there's a lot to say here. <laughs> I'm just trying to work out where to start. So in terms of the mercury, we've been thinking about submarine versus subaerial, and there's really different chemistry because, of course, if you're emitting into a water column. Um, then, uh, then you've got different environmental lifetime for different species than you have if you're emitting into the atmosphere. You've also got, in terms of submarine and mid-ocean ridges, you've got the increased pressure due to the water column. So, for example, halogen emissions from the mid-ocean ridges are much, much lower because they're a low pressure degassing in a basalt. So you don't actually get a lot, so much halogens coming out of those and possibly some re retardation in terms of the sulfur dioxide coming out as well. So that's why carbon dioxide, which is a high pressure species, is an interesting one to think of between the two. Um, the, certainly there have been studies in terms of, uh, and it, people have focused more on the subaerial for those reasons, uh, because you don't have the mediating effect of the ocean uh, between, uh, between, the, um, between the two in some ways. But there have been thoughts about like ridge length, subduction zone length. Um, I think that that's been more like, uh, um, in terms of the geoplates type models uh, and things like that. So, so something certainly at the back of my head, but probably something I think of a bit more when I'm thinking about long-term carbon dioxide emissions uh, on the planet, um, rather than these mercury, these mercury pulses and their signals. But we very much do think about, I mean, I could give you, maybe I, hopefully I'll get the chance to give you uh, another talk sometime about the differences in the signals we see between submarine large igneous provinces and sub-aerial sub-igneous provinces. 
And there's a really interesting story about osmium there and osmium isotopes as well. Great, thanks very much. I think Penny King had a question. Hi, um, thank you so much, Tamsin, for a wonderful talk. And um, thanks also to Monet and Martin for sharing this talk with ANUs and beyond. I see people from all over the place on this. It's great. Um, Tamsin, I was wondering, have you measured the chemistry of the particulates from the Icelandic volcano that is Hulharan? Hulharan. Um, <laughs> and um, if so, is there some chemistry going on on the surface of those particles that's also um, affecting the lung behaviour? And um, I was wondering if you'd measured mercury on those particles. Uh, we didn't do mercury measurements, measurements from Holler in itself. Uh, as I said, doing the mercury measurements is a bit more specialist. Um, you, need, you, you need to take a lot of glassware. Well, the, the leaders are actually some of the worst adapted pieces of field equipment I've ever worked with. These like long tubes of glass, that's to get the reactive gaseous mercury. Uh, and I've uh, broken so many on volcanoes, I can't tell you, and it's so annoying because it's always the best sub. You've spent, you know, two, a whole afternoon getting the sample and then you break it. So we didn't actually do mercury measurements on that. I'd love to have done mercury measurements on that eruption, but we didn't have the resources at the time. Oh, um, I was actually wondering if it was on the surfaces of the particles. Yeah, so mercury is a really interesting one because it's, it's, an, extraordinary, it's an extraordinary element. Um, it's got like a total, it's got this crazy electron configuration and then it, it's got this crazy property, you know, the, 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 I don't know, you know, I'm old enough that we were allowed to have mercury thermometers in the labs at school and it was always a highlight for me when someone broke one of those and it skidded off and the little balls across the floor of the lab and the, the sulfide kit had to come out. But uh, we, we, I don't think kids are allowed to do that anymore for safety reasons. So it probably explains a lot about me, how many mercury oh, no, we did that too. You put your fingers yeah. in. <laughs> but um, it was, um, it, it comes out of the volcanoes largely as a gas, so largely as gaseous elemental mercury or GEM. Yes. But it also can be reactive gaseous mercury, which is, uh, which, which is uh, an oxidized, oxidized form, but no one's quite sure exactly what it's in. But that's the stuff, that, that's what drops out of the gas. And part of the dropping out is actually going into the particle phase. So it's probably in the particle phase as things like mercury 2 chloride. Um, and, uh, and so yes, mercury is only in the aqueous particles, quite possibly absorbed onto the surfaces as well. Um, and there's been some interesting experiments. So a guy called Pierre Dermel, in, um, who's now uh, back in, in, in Belgium, um, has done some really, some of his, him and his students have done some really nice work looking at reactivity on largely ash because it's easier to handle. Yeah. But there's a, there's a whole bunch of heterogeneous chemistry potentially going on in these plumes. Uh, and actually the sulfur dioxide oxidation route, one of the ways it can oxidize is by metal catalysis in, 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 in aerosol on particles. Yeah. Um, and it's really poorly parameterized in the models. So actually something we're working on now is, is whether we can do a better job of that in terms of the, that, that process going on in volcanic plumes. But it, it's quite tricky to parameterize because there's a lot of there's a lot of variability, um, and really what we'd like to do is lab experiments. But they're quite we 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 haven't necessarily found the right group to work with to do those lab experiments. Okay, we can talk further. <laughs> yes, that would be great. Great. Um, so I think I'm just conscious of the time. We are sort of five minutes over the hour, so I think there's probably a lot of other questions, but maybe we should should leave it there for now. Um, and if I'm sure uh, you can email Tamsin. And be oh, absolutely. Yeah, my email address is pretty easy to find because um, if you just type my name into the internet, I think I'm the first. Uh, uh, pretty well, it's not a very it's it's not a very <laughs> common name. So I'd I'd be delighted to uh, to answer more questions by email. Also, like I see that Dick Arculus has said the point. I was Dietmar Muller and the Geoplates group was who I was trying to uh, allude to earlier. So um, that's in answer to your question, Ray. Yeah, great. So, so thanks uh, again, uh, Tamsin, for giving us a wonderful talk. And we hope that in the future that um, we, we can actually have Tamsin come physically when you know, in, in the <laughs> far future one day we'll all be able to travel again, um, which seems very, very distant right now. But that was really wonderful. Um, so thanks everyone for coming. Um, next week we have another seminar uh, by Mike Byrne from University of St. Andrews. Uh, he's an expert on 
or um, atmospheric dynamics and drought. And so please tune in for that. Um, but uh, thanks everyone for coming and thanks very much, Tamsin. Okay, have a, have a nice evening. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna go and have my breakfast. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Bye now. Thank you.